I'm sure they all tell you, when I was a kid, I used to like to draw and do all that, you know, I mean, that's what I did too. I drew as a kid, but I used to take comic books that I was reading and just kind of, you know, copy them, you know. Uh, see shadow for shadow, shade for shade, line for line type thing, and that's how I got better at drawing and eventually painting. I used to get used to inks and then it was like color for color, everything. Just copying the, that right out of the comic books. You know, like as a kid, I would do things like cut food out of magazines. I did that for like a couple of years. I would just cut food out of magazines and then rearrange it, you know. I collect things, you know. I feel like I'm a collector and a rearranger more than anything. Um, so, you know, back in the day when Xerox machines first came out, I used to take my allowance and I would just take all the stuff that I had in my pockets and copy it and put my hand on the machine. You know, this idea of collecting images. Yeah, I started as a kid. Um, I mean, um, I think I remember in kindergarten um, drawing a cat and they put it on the school newsletter. And um, I think it was just that immediate, it was a black cat, it was probably around Halloween time. And just that immediate recognition of, wow, I can, I can do something, you know. Um, and I just kind of ran with it and never really stopped drawing. I think everybody starts with a crayon in their hand. And I didn't put my crayon down. Um, I never have been at a point in life where I didn't make art. Art is part of my life. It's like I make things. I, it's, um, I put my interior content out in front of me where I can see it so I better understand myself. I worked in a fabricating shop. I was a janitor right down the street at Erie Steel Products at the time. And, you know, they had welding and, you know, we put up buildings and stuff and I witnessed all that, worked around it, and I saw the scrap that they generated too. And that's, that always kept my interest in, um, you know, right up to until today. So I stopped working there after 10 years and thought I could make things out of the things they throw out instead of the things they're buying necessarily. So that kind of, um, you know, I'd stay after work at night and make some little things and, um, and it got a lot of attention and it got, it like started a fire. <laughs> it started a big fire and I'd been keeping it going. So it's like a literal metal garden. So the, the garden inspires me and then they, you know, they're trying to both go at it here. There's, there's metal trees that are 22 foot tall here. There's one anyway. And there's some little trees and spheres that plants can grow in. There's a lot of scrap everywhere and that's what got me going on this, working at a shop where there was like, the handrail guy has his own tubing pile of scraps and they were neat, interesting cuts of brand new material but it was just called the drop or the scrap, you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I get a lot of scrap. It's all around us. And so there's a few shops in Erie that are real generous and like they'll donate their whole, like whatever you see in our scrap, help yourself. You know, and I don't have to go crazy with it and they know I'm not cashing it in, making art out of it. So that makes them happy. And sometimes they even buy the art. <laughs> and you know, so they support in many ways. In between commissions, I try to, hurry up and get back to the purest fun of just creating for a good idea comes to mind. Just like in the movies, like when a guy has a dream at night and he rushes to the studio in the morning, those aren't a commission usually, it's an idea and it's a, it's a burst. And sometimes those are the good fruit that you should s still make so that then it gets bought and then others are commissioned from that. So I try to do both. I try to, um, I listen and watch what people do like to buy because that's important, like you're, you're not, they don't necessarily need this, so um, I don't like to think of it as a vanity thing, though. I like to think of them, especially the functional art, like I'm sitting on a nice bench, 
you know, and that and you're sitting on a nice chair that's hopefully comfortable and and a fire can actually warm you and you could cook there even if you wanted to. And um, so, so where they end up, I like it to be public where people are usually having a good time in a park, a zoo, college hopefully, and in private gardens where you know, you're out you know, with your friends or yourself in your backyard enjoying your yard. So it's something that fits into someone's life. It's not necessarily an object on their wall they all go gather and gaze at like some icon. If you make it fun and pour your passion into it, people support that. People support the spirit of something often enough to keep it going, even if they're not buying the art. So it's like there's more to it than just selling art but it's definitely conceivable and I've been doing it 15 years full time. So it's hard to believe. I can't even believe I'm doing it. It's like a dream come true. It's like, you know, the old joke, you know, pinch me and wake me up and be like, oh, I'm back on a job again. You know, I'm working, <laughs> I got to punch in and do that. You're only an artist when you're making art. You know what I mean? It's like the process right now, you're a filmmaker. I mean, later when you're like, if you're, you know, watching, a video on television you're not a filmmaker right you're, you are right now you're making your film and it reminds you your process is what threads everything together you know you don't just make a work and it's here and another one's here and these things are unrelated the process day to day the work ethic art requires work ethic if you don't have work ethic you can't do art because it's not for the money and it's not because somebody's going to understand you because chances are if you're really true to yourself and you're making real work, you're challenging their sense of aesthetic values to the extent that they don't even like it, right? So the process is really what it's all about, the work ethic. My ideas uh, tend to revolve around my psyche, you know? It's like I'm not making a lot of ideas up about other, about things. I, I, uh, for me, my work presently, and it's something I've gone back to is to simply work on my, my symbolism and try to have an understanding of, uh, you, know, the, that, you know, the elephant we ride called the unconscious mind, right? It's like, I can tap right into mine. For me, it's like always right there. And it gets a little bit um, overwhelming, you know, when it's just always right there. So when you put it still on a piece of paper, you know, it gives you an opportunity to think about um, the deeper meanings, uh, you know, for you and your life. I'm extremely attracted to the geography that I was born in. Sand with pine trees growing in it and the flat stones. And um, it's just very, very specific to right here, fresh water and pine trees. There is a very supportive community of older artists and art administrators who have helped me. And I wouldn't have found that elsewhere because it was kind of like de facto. It was like, I was just, it's like my, it was birthplace, you know, how I'm in the community. So I've had the opportunity here that I wouldn't have in other places because I didn't pursue any higher education. I barely graduated high school. I'm a very smart person, but I just like, it doesn't matter to me. I just went and did art and did what I wanted to do. Well, I found people that believed in me. I couldn't have done that as easily in San Francisco. When I left there and came back here, you know, having um, uh, John Vanco uh, give me opportunity had a huge impact on, on my life. So that's the kind of thing, the people around me that I knew, it's like, it's my tribe. I, I'm in my tribe. It's, they love me because I was born here. school like anyone in the 70s well, unless you were lucky enough to find someone teaching classical painting and drawing you were pretty much you know doing color theory and which that's still part of what I do but you know more at more abstract things just uh, it was where where things were going and a lot of people that like to do classical more classical work like I do uh, have that exact same 
issue. Most of the teachers that I really got involved with at Edinburgh were the hard-nosed, tough love types, you know. You're never going to amount to anything. These drawings are, are elementary, was one of the teacher's favorite saying. This is elementary. You could do better than that, you know. So, but there were some teachers that I liked, but they were because they're dry, sarcastic wit, you know what I mean? And just through them telling me, you know, sarcastically <clears throat> about art and how it really is out there, <clears throat> I really got into it. I've always had teachers around me, and men and women, people around me, who were supportive of whatever my talents or, or skills were, and who always encouraged me to keep on going forward. So I found that in uh, after high school, undergraduate school, and then on to the University of Iowa. Uh, and uh, amazing uh, men and women uh, who were always there to answer my questions. I don't believe in art education. I don't think that, uh, you know, to be an artist, I think I think that's kind of like some fantasy from the last century. Like, oh, there's these, like, these impressionists and they have, like, studios and isn't this wonderful? Look, you can be an artist and you're free and you don't think about business. I don't think that at all. I don't have any choice in this matter. I am an artist. It has been both a blessing and a curse, so to speak. I don't make money. I'm misunderstood. There is no way to be how I am, it's part of my process. And the idea that somebody could teach how to do this is like so foreign to me. A degree is so expensive now, even at a state school. So there's a lot of pressure from parents to do something more practical. And I understand that, that they don't want to go in debt $100,000 and then their child is going to be a painter or a wood furniture maker. You know, I, I understand that pressure, but then it's hard when you have students and you can tell that they're an artist. They've got the soul of an artist and they're kind of being pushed into something more practical. And usually they find their way though. I had a stroke and it was from a torn carotid artery. And that was very shocking to me because they had all kinds of theories about that. It was like, okay, you're, you were Viking and stuff like that. But it turns out it just was twisted and it ruptured, all right? I had no history of, uh, in my family about it. It's just like, it was very shocking to me, right? And I couldn't speak at the beginning. I couldn't speak a, a word, right? I have aphasia, which just means the brain sends a signal to uh, your my mouth and just it's it's screwed up let me say <laughs> because uh, uh, part of my brain dies the uh, doctor was showing me uh, images of my carotid and stuff like that and what I was seeing was like the uh, um, Amadeus, like dun, 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 I was like, I'm going to use those. I'm going to use those, right? So basically, I sculpted virtual trees, and then I put them into the uh, um, scans, right? And I create layer after layer and then I put them in light boxes right because that's the natural environment that you should view it in so that's one type of work and the other ones called early man which I'm very excited about but it's a, a hard choice that I for me to make because my doctor said okay you're going to um, become a left-handed artist right and I I am I am because I I can do like drawing 
with my left hand, but I also can do it very gently with my right hand, just digitally. People ask more recently, is your work about environmental issues with um, a series I made of animals that are constructed out of plastic and um, consumer waste? Um, and so there are environmental concerns that are in the background, but then what inspired me was finding a clump of buffalo fur down the street, and I didn't know what it was, and then we discovered what it was, and I thought, what am I going to do with this? And John helped me extract all this buffalo fur through the fence of the Erie Zoo that borders the golf course and the buffalo farm in um, Edinburgh, the, the, uh, Wood and Nickel. They were saving buffalo fur for me. Um, I collected household um, clear plastic to sculpt what we called future bison. So there was like the old bison that looked real but was much bigger versus what we call future bison to contrast um, like the primordial beast versus the, um, anyway, the one that's made out of trash basically. The most recent example is my dust bunnies, which is a p household pun. I did a series of works um, that used household punning. This idea is like a lot of ideas where I, I have an idea that starts out as what if? Like, what if I tried to make a bunny out of actual dust? Could I do it? And what would that look like? That's, that's where a lot of my ideas start with. And oftentimes it doesn't work at first or it fails, but then I figure out a different way to do it because these aren't traditional materials. So there's the obvious humorous side of that, but also there's a deeper meaning to that, which is that this is stuff that our family has cast off and that's usually discarded. And then I reformulate it into something new, which relates to rabbits as symbols in many different cultures as, um, as a rebirth of sorts. So in a way it's a meditation on passing time and trying to grab those things that's from our everyday life and make something else out of it. I always thought of talent as something different than being able to render something to look like something in art. Um, I mean, yes, that is a talent, but it's a talent that a lot of people possess that can't be artists, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I can teach you some technical skills, but if you do not have a soul, um, I cannot give you one. And so I equate with talent. The reality of some special work of art comes with you being this unique, very special person. Um, if, you don't, if you don't have the skills to get it out, it's your job to find people who can help you uh, with those skills. Being an artist is tough and you have to be really inventive and you have to you have to really like you just have to work really hard in order to do what you love as opposed to, to being a slave to the system essentially but it's it's worthwhile if you have the ability you know what I mean but everybody has different talents and some people have to work harder to survive as an artist and some people just plain can't do it at all and, uh, you know, I feel pretty fortunate. But how many students I have seen that we would call talented in what I call proclivities or um, entitlements that they've had during their life, maybe they've had art classes for a million years, you know? And they get, and they, they squander all that. Uh, where people that are hungry enough, um, and, you know, of course there's people who think that they're much better than they are, or whatever, but, uh, to think that this, uh, this magic thing that only certain people have, I think, is bizarre. And the students that I see that work at things, and they're open to things, and they use their imagination, uh, can far... I've seen so many people that have what we would call talent, and they just don't put any effort into it. It just goes away. By constantly shifting what you can do and sort of putting it back, and saying, okay, what can't I do? I'll use the strength that I've obtained from being, from having achieved something. I'll use that, but I'll develop new technical skills. So that's what talent is. 
a long answer to your question. I wanted to um, to be a painter, you know, and it just I started looking at other art. Um, when I discovered the Surrealists, I was just like, oh my god, this is this is what I want to do. It's um, representational imagery, but it's also has this mythological, dreamlike um, storytelling. You know, um, that's the part of uh, painting that I really fell in love with. It was just the the part of where you can tell a story where you not necessarily don't really know what you're talking about. People ask me about content of my work a lot. Well, what does this mean? What, what do you... Um, I don't like telling anyone, you know, because what it means to me is not what it mean, it's going to mean to you. Each, each viewer brings his own experiences to it. So if you see an image of ruins or the planet Jupiter, um, you're going to bring it, bring your own experiences to it, and it's going to mean something different to you. I grew up in an immigrant family. Um, we were Macedonian Orthodox, so I was exposed to Orthodox iconography as a child, and the churches were just filled with these painted images. And um, I think that kind of developed my sense of um, space and of style and of just like a visual storytelling. The process of making it is what drives me. Um, when I'm in the middle of a painting and just working out, painting a stone or painting like a hundred stones in a day, um, you're just, you're in there and that's what you're doing in that moment. Um, and that's the part, that's, that's the creation. That's like, okay, this part has this little highlight here. The light's gonna hit it this way. This stone will float this way, or I'm gonna turn the, you know, it's, you're thinking in those kind of parameters of just how you're gonna make the image, and that's where you're lost. That's where time doesn't exist. You're just, you're focusing, you're, you have paint, you're mixing. You're not really thinking about anything but that moment. I, I've had to be very, uh, you know, inventive in my ways of making a living as an artist because I just could never handle a Walmart job or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like I knew that I wanted to be a creative person and always have that ability to create. Now, I, I, I fail re repeatedly in business, but I, I'm, I have to do it in order to continue on as an artist. You know what I mean? I, I've had to like, I, I got to a point where I was making things so large you know, fresh out of graduate school for, for the first three years out of graduate school. I was like, I was working so hard on these larger sculptures and then, you know, I would, like I said, I was, if I would sell them, it would be like underpriced and then you're also, you're, you're dealing with the galleries, they're taking huge amounts of money out of the amount of stuff that you have and as a metal worker they're taking, then you have your materials cost by the time you boil it all down, you're literally getting $1.50 an hour for your efforts as a, with a person with a master's degree. Also being a handicapped artist, it's like I, when I was a young man, I got hurt in a, in a, in a fight at high school. I, was, I had some dreadlocks, football players didn't like it, they beat me up, broke my neck. So I ended up being disabled from the age uh, 17 on. And so to be an artist that like continually makes work, oh, I'm 41 now, uh, and like I said, I work with a lot of kids, 
people are always like, wait, what? You actually do stuff? You know, you're not just like sitting in a wheelchair, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? It's tough with like, because I think that it is a small town and people struggle and to just get their, their hands on just a little piece of recognition because like there's just not a lot of positive recognition for artists in this town and and it can be really discouraging you know what I mean and I see that and as a venue owner I really work hard to foster a place for every little area of it and and even the dumbest ideas have potential to grow into really beautiful things. I'm, I'm generally impressed no matter where I travel to with the level of artistic activity that goes on these days uh, no matter what what city I end up in it seems like there's a, a blooming art community. Uh, so I, I don't know to what extent it's peculiar to Erie. I do think that the fact that we have this, this large state university here with that large group of that, you know, a thousand art makers, that's, that's, that's big. In a, uh, in a community the size of this, that has a big impact. But, you know, it, it's a physically beautiful place. It's got all those, all those kind of attributes. And uh, it is a relatively cheap place to live, uh, cost of living wise. That that encourages artists <laughs> too. Uh, even though uh, the opportunities for supporting oneself as an artist are as minimal as they are anywhere else. I'd speak to a group uh, and I'll ask them, "How many of you are involved in the arts?" You know, and depending upon the group, two or three hands go up, or a half a dozen hands go up, and. I said, so the rest of you are not involved in the arts at all, right? And no. Everybody sort of looks at one another. I said, so none of you listen to music, none of you watch TV, read books, and they look at, well, well of course we do, you know, it's like, but they don't think of that as being the arts, but that is, <laughs> that is the arts. Uh, so I, I've always <laughs> thought about it that way, and I've always thought about it in terms of, you know, um, what, what is a, is there a democratic art? How democratic can art be, you know, because, well, those, those of us who are into it, uh, the, the more sophisticated the concepts, the more appealing it is to us. But uh, that's kind of an, uh, uh, antithetical to uh, the idea of, uh, of a democratic art. Um, that, whole, that whole thing has always interested me. And I don't know, I, I've just, uh, I've been driven by a desire to share art with others because I enjoy it so much. I just came, it took me years and years and years to come from another solar system. I had one chance to land, we finally made it, but I have to leave. So I landed right in the middle of the Sahara. When you got back, there's nobody even lives there. It's just all hot, there's nothing there. <laughs> the purpose of art, um, would you say it's a way of communicating since the caveman? Is that far enough back? <laughs> there's going to be an audience for certain people, and my audience may be limited, but I've always tried to forge on. But when you see whatever I've done, there's an offer, there's enough following, they know it's Fran Shans. And I keep thinking, oh, well, this one's uh, uh, desperately different than the last. And they know you're, you know, if it was like the earliest wood, or it's those assemblages with the boxes, and it's, it, it just, it doesn't betray you. So the new drawings I was showing you a little bit, uh, they, uh, uh, it was, I was working a little bit tighter, like any of my early things through engineering and shading and the, those drawings 10, 12 years ago, Bob Hagel wanted to collect those. I'm sure if he saw this new stuff now, <laughs> I mean, you know, because you saw his drawing book he'd done and you saw he's kind of like, you know, maybe I was a little tight. So now I'm, I've loosened up a tad. But once you put it under one wrap like he did, took three years to do this, then I think he's a little behind now. <laughs> yeah. But when he did it, whatever it is, is a franchise.
da 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 It's tough to, it's tough to, it's tough to sell, sell art out there. And if the gallery isn't crazy about what you're doing, you know, they could have a hard time promoting it. If, if they do take it, I've been very lucky working with Kata Gallery and we've worked together for 20 years and have made each other money. Why do people buy a piece of art, you know? Why, why do people want a certain person's work or what, what attracts them? You know, do they have someone that's telling them that this is a good investment? Do they want something for over the couch, right? Um, are they, uh, you know, I, can't, I don't even know who, um, who finds things in my work and why. You know, I do know um, in terms of selling work that I've always underpriced my work or I've been told that I do. And that's because I don't want it simply to hang in wealthy homes. I knew that artists don't, I, I, it's going to be a real struggle if I'm just trying to be a painter in the world. Um, I talk to other people, um, especially my professors, you know, who uh, are professors, they're like, yeah, it's, it's, you're not going to be able to just do that, you know, just be the painter, you know, most likely. And they were, they were also painters themselves who were also teachers, you know. So when I was in school, I always had in mind that I can't not do this. I have to paint, but I also have to have a way to live. Starting out as a d designer, even though my background was in art, right? Uh, at that point, and you might remember that in the late 70s where, you know, designers were looked on as like second class citizens. When I went to grad school, they said, you're cake decorating. You really want to do this? It's better to suffer, be a waitress or do something else and not make any money and still do it for your work, right? A true artist will always come back to their art. Will they do other things to make a living? Absolutely, I mean, I did, and I think a lot of people do. Um, I'm fortunate that at this point in my life, that's all I have, I just do my art. But, um, you know, you have to go, you have to, you have to find your way and your path, and, and everybody has one. You just have to you just have to sniff it out and and stick to your art. Just don't don't let it go. Even if you go through periods of not doing anything, uh, pay attention to what's going on. about this time of year, it was, it was uh, mid to late September. And I was living in Northeast at the time. And, um, and I'm sitting in, uh, in a little town, the little town of Orvieto in, in uh, Umbria. And, I'm, and I have a sketchbook with me and I'm just kind of doing some sketches of some olive trees. And, and it, it, it dawned on me that what I'm looking at, I'm looking at every day when I'm back in Erie. Uh, because we have a very similar light, we have very similar climate, uh, we have very similar landscapes, and especially living in the Northeast and all the vineyards and so on. And I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of inspiration in Erie uh, for somebody like me. And when I lived in New York, where I was, you know, I mean, you, you get into that more urban, gritty kind of scene, but my work never went there. When I first kind of surfaced as a painter here in town, because I never was involved in the Erie art scene up until 10 years ago, 
and I took a class at the museum and, and uh, Fran Chons was the painting instructor and Franny right away realized that you know this is something I've done before and and uh, and he used to as I go through a painting he'd always say that when I when I when I'd finished the painting that I had this sort of you know I'm painting with pretty colors I'm painting nice scenes I'm painting but I sort of had this darkness to my work and and he, and he kind of identified with that as being sort of my signature. You know, I think that I think that we're missing the boat a little bit in school because when somebody is engaged in the arts, be it music, uh, visual arts, movement, um, they they're connecting to something with a with a thought process that is probably a little different than how they're solving their algebra problems. And uh, for some students, it's really the only way they can connect. And when they don't offer that, or don't have that opportunity, then they just think that they're flat out failures because they can't think logically like an, a, a math student would or a science student might. And, um, and I think that you know the arts and, 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 a, and a good art program starts to nourish the idea that they can they can succeed the way they think. In order for something to be perfect, you got to push to be perfect. Everything that's in my mind doesn't come out perfectly on paper. You know, I have to work to get to that perfection, that level of perfection that I want. With me, like, I have a problem with patience. <laughs> and, I mean, those paintings that I take a long time on, it's, it's, it's hard to go back once I leave a session. And with those paintings that you saw with the thick and pasta, it's like I had to keep myself engaged somehow. So it's like the painting was always evolving. We were in a state of change because it was me just trying to stay yeah. at the easel, you know. Whereas... That's why I like to work quick, because I know how I am. I know that if I don't do it in a certain amount of time, it's not going to get done, you know. Well, when they produce, when they make heroin from the poppy, it's a closed, aborted bulb. It's before it opens and flowers, and then they cut the side of it, and then some white mucus milk comes out, and that's the heroin, so to speak, or that's the opium, so to speak. So this is pretty much the bulb or the opium plant pretty much attacking me, you know what I'm saying? Like you see a face here, you see a face here, and then there's my face. Like there's gonna be a crack going down the middle of my face as like I'm breaking apart kind of thing. And then in the background, it's just gonna be a bunch of faces kind of falling in and out of each other, you know what I mean? So in this area, it's, it's gonna be more just blobs but there's still gonna be faces coming out of one another. Some are gonna be crying, some are gonna be yelling at me, some are gonna be laughing. I mean, it's gonna be real mental as far as, you know, <clears throat> because I mean, when I was going through that addiction, man, I was, there was a lot of problems with my mentality, you know what I mean? So, like this guy, he's, he was always screaming at me, stop, stop, so I mean, that's quite, kind of like my soul telling me to stop. Where, and then there's my soul too, crying, saying, you're done. I really had, I, I was really trying to, like you diffuse the light in an area, I've tried to diffuse the visual aspects. Like you take a person and you, and you put them in a room. I wanted to break up all the shapes and color to a point where you lost the image of that person. And in doing so, I like to play around with thickness as well. So. That's why you got those really thick applications of paint and, and really uh, garish colors popping out at you and everything. So, so you're kind of, you see in the image of the person, but then again, you take a step back and then you don't see anything. So it's almost like I was playing with the visual chords. The ones that really got me were the Ashcan School Impressionists, the American Impressionists. I mean, they, they were just amazing. 
and then just knowing their story as well. It was just a gritty story, somewhat like, you know, the Cursed Painters or whatever from the Impressionist era. You know, like they were the ones that were drunk all the time. And, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I was influenced because of their hard living lives, but in a way I kind of was, you know, like I was already from there, you know, the, the dirty drinking alleyway, ash can school, American art. I never thought I would even um, sell any paintings. I didn't want to. I said, hey, I'm making a living, commercial art. I'm going to keep all these, and when I'm 100, I'll have this lifetime of stuff to look at. Uh, then reality hit in, kicked in when I didn't want to do graphic stuff anymore. And uh, I said, well, I better sell these things, or this isn't going to work. Now it doesn't matter to me. I'll sell them right off the easel right away and not even think twice about it. I like beautiful stuff, you know. I don't like waking up and listening to all the tragedy that any more than anybody else does. So I go for a hike every day and there's plenty of places to go around here. And I, one of mine is just straight out down that street through the cornfield and back through the trails in the woods. And I get an hour just by doing that big loop back the railroad tracks. Um, I've got reference material for the rest of my lifetime just from back in there as far as landscape stuff goes. I have uh, everything cataloged very well so that I can find the last 20 years worth of photos. And, uh, but I always, I, I rarely work from life, the life drawing I do. And, uh, it, yeah, I always have something ready that I'm going to paint. So if, if something blank goes up there, it has something on it real quick. So I wouldn't know what to do if I just stared at a blank canvas. Because I don't, I'm amazed at cartoonists who uh, stuff just flows out of their their minds. And I don't, I don't have that. You know, I really have to have something that I, whether it's you sitting there or used to have photo, photos pinned all over my easel. Now, just about six months ago, I started working from a monitor. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's been taking a while to get used to it because they're brighter than photos and I have to kind of tone things down. I'm, I am, I'm still figuring out how to do it. I guess if I was going back to school again, I'd probably try to take the animation because there seems to be a ton of it out there, at least right now, until something changes. Um, and that is, that's usually what I tell younger people. I said, if I were doing it, you know, now, because I love to paint, I would also pick painting. But I wasn't, you know, I didn't have to deal with computer art as, Competing with the way I do my art at the time, I love I love stuff that people generate on the computer. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. It's just not what I want to do. As a teacher, I think I pride myself on like understanding where those students are coming from by a glance or by a question or I try to see all the different places that they're coming from and I have to shut that all down when I come here and it has to be like some kind of feedback to myself which you know it's 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 um, very difficult and and the way I think my process is that I'll make lists I make sorry I'm getting up there I have all these like lists and ideas and things and I'll make all these lists and I make little boxes that I have to like cross out. And then I start working on the list and I go way off key. Like, and then something else happens. There isn't always inspiration. There sometimes is, like John's Amadeus moment. <laughs> sometimes you just get an idea. Um, and other times ideas aren't coming and that's the part John's better at than I am where you just you have to get in the studio and work on something clean the studio or work, do something in your sketchbook. But either way that the idea comes, then there's the initial working through it and possibly failing. So I think 
think where the craft can come in is a process of figuring out is this working and if not then can this lead to something else can I try it a different way can I can I shift my idea or, or try a different approach um, and then when you have a success usually it's either a partial success or there's another aspect of that idea you haven't explored yet so that leads you to another piece and another piece and then when you've cycled through that and there's no more challenge you know what you're doing you know then I think it's it's time to quit and move on to another idea yeah I mean all throughout college it was just work 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 it really wasn't enough time to be uh, inspired by anything or or inspiration wasn't really my push to do anything it was just I want or I need to do this as who I am. I am an artist and I want to be an artist. So in order to become an artist, you have to work. You got to do the work and it's always hard work. There's a lot of other things I do to keep this flowing. I don't think art should just flow by itself and from itself. In other words, you know, being involved in the community and caring for your neighbor is a big part of this too, actually. You just keep on working. And so you learn early on that criticism is an important part of learning and development. And if you win more than you lose, which could be 51%, then you're ahead of the game. There's something about the art world where, you know, you've, you've got to face this kind of abyss all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's why I like to, you know, have a bunch of stuff that I can just pull from when the abyss is there. <laughs> Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's like yeah. a madness, right? Like John Updike used to say, you know, writers, like fiction writers, go to the abyss, look over it and come back, and mad men jump off. And if you're not looking into the abyss, then what the hell are you doing <laughs> except decorating? Everything works against us, you know, getting into that state where time, time goes away and we're in that fugue state or that trance state or whatever it's called. And everything works against that, right? Um, on top of that, how do I know that things taste the same to me as they do to you? And how do I know that they, I hear the same things that you do? And the thing that flummoxes me most of late is that how can people think so differently? Like, I am not a concrete thinker, you know? And there are people in the world that are like, totally, and they're functioning well, right? Um, but what about that? Is there some value in that kind of self-reflection? And, and no matter what you have to do uh, to make your living, you've got to be able to have something to search for. Or I, I don't know what I don't know what life's about. You know, people don't collect music to put it on their wall and say, "Look, here, I've done this." You know, you know what I mean? So it's this objectification is a problem, I think, in the art world, if I can say that. But also this digital thing, you know, what a uh, rabbit hole is digital work. I mean, it's just a rabbit hole. Uh, you know, again, when you say that anybody can get a camera or anybody can do some music and put it online, <clears throat> there it is, you know, there it is. I'm not interested in setting a goal in the outside world, I guess. I'm just coming to that realization that it's like my goal would be to try to like delight myself or you know come to some conclusion in what I'm doing not care about what anybody else thinks that's really hard when I come to the studio I try to forget all of the rules that I teach my students and I think that's what I do to kind of like take stock of uh, you know what's going on with me you know like not do it for a reason like not problem solve you know, just experiment and then juxtapose things together. I don't think there's anything original anymore. I think we're done, you know, we're done with like post, post, post originality. So then what do you do if you still have to keep working and you still have the compulsion to work? I think it's the purest form of humanity. It's the, the drive in us to make something that isn't there. I hardly even know 
what my artwork is. I'm still trying to figure it out. With each time I lay the brush on the canvas, you know, it's it's just as much of a mystery to me as it is to anybody else. Art to me is just something that's been driving me crazy for the last 38 years and will probably keep driving me crazy until I'm six feet under. It's capturing that very personal world that I am in as, a, as Tom Ferraro, the human being on this earth. But it also captures my time. And it's not something that I could have done in 1816 or 1916. So there's sort of a universality to it, to my, to my contemporary world that I live in, but it's also very personal to me. That's when it's art. But what art is, it's like, it's expressing the unexpressible, you know? It's trying to fill, you know, to like make up the void between two minds. It's like, how can I get you to see what's in here? I mean, you and I are talking, right? But it's like, you don't see my interior world. And my interior world is so rich and so big and so filled with details that the only way that I can possibly not be alone in it is to express it to you. And the only way to do that is to get it out where you can see it, because that's how you take that data in. share it with people and I always tell them what you need to understand is there are gardens which are are pristine um, there are gardens just beginning and there are gardens which are senescent and that's just like life uh, and so that's just like a garden a garden is never done um, it is always evolving there is something always coming on like the tulips right now the magnificent Dutch tulips that are that are up there. This is their first year. They'll never be that beautiful again. Um, they're huge. They're colorful. Um, you enjoy them now because they won't be that way. Stephen, as in all of our work for 50 years, is the sculptor and he creates the forms. In the landscape, he worked with the forms to recreate it. In the art, in the in the Raku ceramics, he started with it. He did his own work, and then over the years, he understood how the two of us, the finished piece was not his alone. I had to add to it, so he had to change the way he looked at the piece. And Stephen and I don't agree in a lot of things. Um, we have adjoining studios with a door that slams frequently. Uh, and continues to over the years. When you think about wh who is an artist, what is an artist, um, how do they practice? Can everybody, anybody be an artist? No. They can be sensitive, and, and I can, by, that's why people take art appreciation courses and art history courses. Um, you, and that's why it's important for art courses to be in grammar schools and high schools. Because what you're doing, you are sensitizing people to the world. You are sensitizing them to structure and color and form and relationships in ways that carry over into other aspects of life. Creativity exists in every aspect of life. You try to teach, you never humiliate. You try to have people learn. And so what I did was I would be I would be saying something fairly quietly, did you consider this? This could be a little stronger. And I kept going past this woman who was in her early 40s. And then we would break um, and everyone would show their drawings. And she said to me, uh, Mrs. K, you never say a word to me about my work. And I said to her in front of the whole class, I said, it is so beautiful. There is nothing I can say to make it any better. She drew in a very primitive kind of way. It wasn't classical Greek or Roman, the way I 
I can draw and I was taught to draw. It was so beautiful. It was outsider art. It said what it needed to say in a very soulful kind of way. I did not want to ruin this woman. And so she understood and the re everybody else understood. As long as you have a sense of um, attention being paid, um, there's a tree out there right now that is totally dead. It has been there for 42 years. I planted it when it was the size of my wrist, bare root. And for some reason I had um, Johnston's Evergreen Nursery come out and look at it. They told me why it was a fungus or a virus or something. It just overnight died after 42 years. I have to take it down now. Attention must be paid to it. Um, we acknowledge the beauty that was there for so long and now it's time I have to take it down.